Hi friends and welcome to another episode of Piano TV. So today we are going to do another analysis for casual music fans, this time with the ever famous like wedding song canon in D. If you missed the previous one I did on Claire de Lune, I'll link it on the screen, check it out. It was a ton of fun to do and I'm very excited about this one. So what we're gonna do is talk a little bit about the history of canon in D and then we're gonna talk about some of the musical elements of it and the theory. But I'm not gonna get like so deep into the theory that if you, you know, if you don't play music, you should still be able to understand where I'm getting with this. So anyway, let's get started. I actually did a piano tutorial for a uh, beginner version of Canon in D recently, and there's going to be a little bit of overlap on the stuff we talk about today and the stuff we talked about that. I'll also link that on the screen if you're interested in learning how to play it on piano. So Canon in D was written by Johann Pachelbel, who was a German Baroque composer, which just means he was writing music in the 17th century. Canon in D was originally written for three violins and basso continuo. So what the basso continuo was, was a little pairing of two instruments. So there'd be like a, a low bass sounding instrument, usually something like a cello or a double bass. And that would be paired with a keyboard instrument that could do chords and stuff. So, you know, like maybe a harpsichord or an early piano or anything like that. So think about the basso continuo as kind of like the harmony. They, they played the background part. And then the three violin parts took over the melody and like the main tune of the song. So let's start by decoding the name. Anything that has like blank in D or F or whatever, it's just telling you what key it's in. So if this song says it's in the key of D, you interpret that to mean it's in the key of D major. Now, if it was minor key, usually the composer would specify they'd write like canon in D minor. Um, usually if you just see like a plain letter by itself, it implies major. So the next thing in the title to decode is the canon part. So what is a canon? Now the simple answer for this is that it's an imitation based song. So in canon and D, the three violins are all playing imitation parts. The first violin here is the trendsetter, and then the second violin part plays the exact same thing, but a couple bars delayed. And then the third violin copies the first bi violin, but by a delay of four bars. And this continues through the whole song, which creates a really neat overlapping effect. So throughout the piece, the first violin is always playing the leader role, and the other two violins are copying those notes two and four bars delayed respectively. But we're gonna listen to examples of that in a minute here. I just wanted to touch on that now. We won't spend too long talking about Pachelbel himself because that would be like a whole other subject for a history video, but we'll touch on him a little bit. So he was really well loved and well respected in his day. And he was actually really good friend with Bach's dad. So that would be Johann Sebastian Bach is like the really, really famous Bach. But Bach would have been like, a little kid when Pachelbel died. So they were a couple generations apart. But yeah, Pachelbel, friends with Bach's dad, and he actually taught Bach's oldest brother, Johann Christian Bach, how to, you know, play piano and stuff like that. Why is everyone named Johann? It's like the John Smith of Germany. So the origin story of Canon in D is unknown. No one really knows why Pachelbel wrote it or like what event he would have written it for, but there is speculation whether or not it has any basis in reality that he wrote Canon in D for Johann Christian Bach's wedding in 1694 because he was known to have written music for the event as were other musician friends and family members known to write music for it. So could have been for that. Unfortunately, Unfortunately, as is bound to happen with the passage of time, Baroque music became really unfashionable in the classical era. So Pachelbel and his music was like entirely forgotten until basically the 19th century in the Romantic period where Baroque music saw a little bit of a resurgence. But Pachelbel's canon didn't really emerge and break through in pop culture until, until 1968 where Jean-Francois Payard did a recording of it that became really famous and it inspired like a whole bunch of imitators until by the time you hit the 80s, it was basically like the most famous classical song ever. So now let's get into the analysis. The first thing I want to talk about is something called ground bass. This is a term used for patterns in music and Canon in D has probably one of the most famous ground bass patterns of all time. If you're a piano player, you're generally going to be playing this. Here's the ground bass I've marked here. You're generally going to be playing that with your left hand. Otherwise, it's usually played by a bass type section or a basso continuo if you were in the Baroque period. So in this case, it's being played by the cello. Okay, so let's talk about the pattern itself in this ground bass here. So we're starting on the tonic, right? Because this is canon D, so our tonic is D. And it's a really interesting pattern. You're alternating moving down a fourth to moving up a second. 
and fourth, second, fourth, you, you kind of see this continue. So, and then in the last couple notes, you move to the dominant, which is a good lead into the tonic to the start of the next pattern. So the reason this really nice pattern, like this fourth, second, fourth, second, fourth, second thing ends up changing at the very, very end to go to the dominant is because it leaves a sound of suspense, a sound of like more music to come. And it leads perfectly back into the tonic and the start of that pattern, which continues and can loop forever and ever, which it basically does in this song. And that's basically how this song works, honestly. The ground bass, this, this musical pattern, basically just repeats over and over until the end, while the higher parts, like the violin parts, go through different variations. So I wanna start by taking a listen to this extremely recognizable ground bass pattern that starts like right from the first second of the song. So a couple minutes ago, we talked about what a canon is. So let's actually take a listen out to how it is applied. So after a ground bass introduction for two bars, you get the first violin entering the picture, which starts the tune. And then a couple bars later, the second violin repeats that main tune, so it's all yellow. And then the third violin repeats it. It's basically like a game of follow the leader where the first violin is a leader. So let's take a listen to the sound of the canon. And I want you to try to see if you can notice the first violin's part getting imitated every two bars. Let's take a look at the song from about two minutes in where we start getting into all those awesome fast notes. So with the yellow highlighter, I've marked the first part, which is like violin number one, the entrance of the tune, which is then repeated by the second violin a couple bars later and so on and so forth. So you can, you can basically the da, 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 da. You can kind of see that part repeated there and then in the third violin and so on. And then while that's happening, the violin, the first violin keeps introducing new parts. So then that's gonna be in blue, which kind of just creates like a, I was gonna say butterfly effect, but it's probably not like that at all. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna leave this on the screen so you can follow along while I play an example. And again, see if you can kind of pinpoint the various imitations and when the new parts enter and keep track of it all. Cause it really is like a lot to listen to. Now, while it's worth noting that the song is definitely a canon in its instrumental form, even like not the piano version is not usually a canon, but like the, the full orchestral version usually is, it also has elements of another song style called a chacon. So the chacon was kind of like the Baroque version of 12 bar blues. It basically just means you have this like repetitive ground bass, this repetitive pattern that the melody instruments jam over for the whole song. So Pachelbel and his song blended these two styles. He blended the Chacon and the Canon. So good job, Pachelbel. Since Canon and D has researched in the pop music world in the last few decades, I thought it would be kind of neat to just like look at some of the songs that have directly taken from Canon and D in their own music that uses like the ground bass that Canon and D uses. And for these songs, I'm not gonna play you clips during the video because I respect copyright, deal with it, but I will link to them on my blog so you can like check out these videos if you don't know what songs I'm talking about or if you wanna like kind of hear it in action. So first let's start with alternative music. If you lived in the 90s, you will know Green Day's Basket Case, and you will also know Oasis's Don't Look Back in Anger, which are very like two iconic songs from the 90s that both use the exact same chord pattern. In pop, you have The Farms All Together Now, which is basically like a direct ripoff of Canon and D. It's like the exact same pattern in the exact same key. 
And then you also have other artists who, instead of like incorporating it in their own songs, they'll do like an actual cover of Canon and D. So George Winston in the 80s wrote a really, really good piano arrangement of Canon. And the Trans-Siberian Orchestra has a really good like Christmas arrangement of Canon and D as well. I actually think that Canon and D has a lot in common with modern pop music. It's like definitely simple and catchy and easily identifiable. It's not like wildly forward or innovative songwriting, but like it's definitely clever. Compared to the previous analysis video I did with Claire de Lune, these are actually like, now that I think about it, they're polar opposites. So Claire de Lune is all about like subtlety and obscurity, whereas Canon and D is like super obvious and super direct and to the point. Both are good in their own unique respects. They're just wildly different. But of the two, like if you're to be caught humming something, you're gonna be humming Canon and D. Just like, I, I don't know if I've ever heard anyone hum Claire de Lune. I guess it's kind of possible, but that doesn't make it better or worse. Just makes it different, right? And I think Canon and D is actually a really good gateway to classical music because of that, because it's so easy for us modern people to listen to and understand. On the blog post, which I'll link to, it's piano TV done and you can just like go to the most recent entry or just check out the description bar. I'll link to different versions, two different versions of Canon and D. One is like a piano solo version and one is like the actual like three violins and a basso continual part. So you can take a listen to that. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this analysis video. I hope you like got something new out of it and maybe you learned a little bit today. Thank you for watching. Send it a like if you enjoyed it and I will catch you guys next time. So for, like, I'm, random cat hairs, I can, like, see it. So, every time I breathe.